Hello, everyone. Welcome. Glad that you're here. Um, we have a really great program today and just want to make sure that that we are actually recording. Yes, we are. And so anyway, so if you miss some of this or you want to share later, you can always share with your friends. We have a wonderful program and there's been a lot of interest in this because I, I think that this is one of the things I'm proud to say that AAPG is dedicated to doing. We want to give you the knowledge and skills that you can use to diversify, to be sort of um, captain of your own destiny, to be able to participate in our changing world. So I'm thrilled to, to introduce you to Vitaly Meyer and John McLeod. Vitaly Meyer is with Petrocubic, and John McLeod is with um, uh, a consulting firm, and he is, has many years of experience in um, exploration in various major companies. So the goal here is to let them show you different tools for mapping, reservoir modeling, seismic interpretation that are very low cost, pay as you go, and in some case, um, totally open source. So what I'll do is I will um, change over and and, and also just, um, just a quick housekeeping. This is, um, I'm Susan Nash, AAPG Director of Innovation, Emerging Science and Technology. Want to invite you to be sure to renew your AAPG membership and also to check out our events that we have coming up. So thank you. So welcome Vitaly. Uh, hello, I'm Vitaly Maya. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay. I'm Vitaly Meyer, I'm Managing Director of Petrocubic Solutions. Uh, I have about 18 years experience working in oil and gas in a variety of companies like uh, Marathon Oil, Maersk Oil, then I did my own consultancy for a few years and then we started this uh, startup and that's uh, kind of part of this I'll be presenting today. And uh, a little bit about our business, so we have a two-sided business uh, in Petrocubic. Uh, one is uh, fire and high oil and gas consultants online. So we help companies and consultants to find each other via our web uh, platform. And the second piece, which I'm going to talk about today, it's uh, access to exploration and production software on demand, where we allow from independent consultants or small companies to access software for a really cost-effective way. So you don't need to buy license, you can rent license for a small fee, even per hour. And today, specifically, I'll also talk about the training option. So we also provide a training option so you can learn any of this commercial software almost for free. So that's what I'll be talking about today. Okay, so software on demand. Yeah, do it like this. Okay, so we're not writing any of our own software. We just partner with existing vendors and we keep growing this list. Obviously, it takes a little bit of time to make a partnership agreements with these vendors and especially larger vendors, it takes more time. But you already see we have 11 partners and we keep bringing more. And right now our suite of uh, products is covering a lot of disciplines. Like you can see probably a lot of these vendors you already know, like CGG, RMD, ROG, Siceway, Petra Sys, Rose, FragGeo, and Plano, maybe a little bit less known in GPT, but the rest, I think most of you are already familiar with. So we cover a variety of disciplines. Uh, and uh, what I want to show today, it's a software self-training, but we also offer it. So you can get the 25 hours, uh, any time you can take of software usage for a very small fee. And uh, yeah, we don't make any money out of this. It's just to really pay for direct uh, cloud course for us. So, and uh, it's uh, for every software you can find on the website, you can take it and learn it. And uh, you'll get uh, access to remote workstation. So everything will be already installed and configured. So you can just like in by a link and start to use it. 
So it's a very simple. And you will see the, the sample projects, the tutorials, the manual, everything. So you can actually learn it with all this data already loaded there for you. You won't be able to bring your own data for training, but you'll be able to use all this data, which is already there. And for many software, it's a lot of data and a lot of sample projects. And I'll show you, which you can just uh, use. And in terms of ordering, and I'll show you in a second, it's also very simple. You just go to our web page, you click, uh, you make a few clicks, put some data, and then in the 24 hours or even less, you'll get a login and you can start using it. So it's very simple. And let me now move to a demo. So the rest of my presentation, I'll just show you a little bit how it works. So first you go to our website, it's a Petrocubic Workspaces, and then we have this page called training. So you go training and that's kind of how it's described everything. And next step, you can select what software you want and you can read about this different type of software if you're not familiar with and they are subdivided by disciplines. So the first one is a reservoir. So for instance, the first one is a TNAP which is a geological modeling, kind of a trail analog. It's also a simulation analog, which is an eclipse uh, uh, similar kind of simulation. Then we have a transit, PVT analysis. Then we have roles and associates with the project array models. Um, the next step is geology. So we have a variety of software to cover geology. So it's a GPT which is geological model, RFD, TNAP, also geological model. And then we have a star steer, with, uh, which is a little bit uh, mostly a geosteering, but there is a geology component in it. Petra C is, that's also actually not a similar, but it uh, has some overlapping functionality, which uh, John will be talking about, UGIS. So it's also a very good tool to do a mapping, volumetric, and some other kind of workflows. Then we have uh, products from CGG and again, this roles and associates. So we also have geophysics, quite a bit, even more. So we also have Seismareware, which is Canadian company, DGB Open Detect Pro, which actually, if you don't know, so they have a free version. So the Open Detect, it's actually free. You can download uh, from their website. It's a geophysical package, but they also have a paid option which is Open Detect Pro, and it has a little bit more functionality, and it's kind of paid, but you can learn it here as well. Then we have Hampson Russell, that's uh, for some seismic modeling, inversions, and everything. And again, GeoTrust, that's also more about the processing and some more sophisticated seismic. And yeah, you, you can scroll. I don't want to go to everything. So we have also petrophysics, just seeding, completion, production, and variety of tools will be key pattern. So you, you select what tool you, you want, let's say it's Tina, then you put some data, blah, 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 then you click order. And after you place an order, so literally it will take you five minutes and after placing an order and paying this small fee, so you'll get a mail which will lead you to a login portal. So yeah, the mail will lead you here. So this is the working portal with the remote desktops and everything. Then you just start it, you click open, and you'll get to workstation. So after you click open, you'll get to this remote workstation. And you see everything will be already installed. So I just put a several software here to show, but everything will be installed. And this remote screens are very high performance. So you can have a really complex 3D graphics and it still work pretty much like you're working naturally on your home or your laptop. So let me show you. So TNAP, if some of you are not familiar with TNAP, that's a product from RFD company and they have a two modules. One is a geology, so you can make a 3D geological model. And the second piece is a simulation where you can run a reservoir simulation. So let me just show, uh, open it and show. So the beauty of this, you don't need to deal with the vendors, the licenses, the configuration, installation, anything. You literally just log in and can start working on it. 
And when you go to each of these software, so they'll be here. So let's say it's Tina, for instance, right? You see it's a lot of tutorials here. So this all tutorials and some sample models, then you have all the manuals and everything. So usually, and also, also the sample project. So right now I'm trying to open this sample project. Okay, here we go. So yeah, this is just a 3D model. And I don't know in Zoom if you can see or not, but it's very fluid. So it's a very nice and fluid 3D graphics. Uh, let me make it a little bit bigger. Yeah, so it could be a little bit bigger. And it's a full functionality. So all these software they come in with full functionality. So even if it's for training, it's kind of free. So it still has all the functionality you can use. So it's no different if you go commercial options. So you can run your model, you can create model, you can learn, read manuals, everything. So yeah, this is a simulation. Yeah, you see this nice model with the gas, oil, and water. So yeah, you can use it. So this is a 3D simulation. So let me show a little bit on a seismic side. And I only put a sizeware, but it's also some other products like DGB and Petrasys, so and Hampson Russell. So obviously we have more. I just put few to show. And Sizeware is not that popular in the United States for whatever reasons, but in Canada, a lot of people are using it in Canada. So it's a similar functionality to IHS Kingdom, I would say. Yeah, so this is a sample project which also comes in. So you see some base map, you see some seismic lines uh, you can actually see. Uh, let me open. Yeah. yeah, so this is some seismic lines you can work with. So, yeah, I don't know what you're saying too much time. So this is a seismic. So you also can use the petrophysics. So like we have a power log. So this would be your petrophysics. So anyway, you can use any software. I don't want to spend too much time on this. But the beauty, you see how quick it is. So you can order, get it in a link, then we just work here, everything is installed. So no hassle to work with vendors. So but more, more than this, so th that is self-training and it costs $79, but everybody who is here, you can write us up and we can give you a 50% uh, discount for this time. So you can get it even uh, cheaper, this training. So what else I want to show you? So what we also see is a pattern, uh, especially for consultants, they often order this training to learn the tool. So you pay a little bit of money to learn the tool. You spend 24 hours, you learn the tool. And then if you have your own project, then you can go commercial, right? right? And the commercially, you can get it with a small fee, but it's a commercial rate and just make your project. And uh, we have this calculator. You also can go to our website. It's called pricing. So click pricing and go there. So you can estimate even before you start to work, you can estimate how much it will cost you. And we have users literally spending 200, 300, $400 to start and finish all their projects. We have consultants like this and you can actually read their stories. You can read their stories on our website. So let's say, yeah, I have a small project. So I'll use only, let's say, five days. So it will be a one week of work, maybe yeah, five hours each day. And I need this simulation. So you see, yeah, it's a $400. So you can already make an estimation just here. 
on a website. And then if you like it, you can register and go and order it commercially. And the difference between training and commercial, the only difference is the data. In a training, you cannot upload your own data and use it, right? And for commercial, obviously, you can upload your own data and use it as a full license. The beauty is it's a per hour rate. So yeah, you'll just pay how much you use. So yeah, you see 400. I don't think you'll find anywhere you can get it for 400. And the same with the power lock or CGG, you can select all other software and do the same. Uh, that's pretty much it. I don't want to spend probably more time just talking. So maybe it's a good time to go to questions. And I see somebody in the chat. Okay, does it support 4K monitors? Yes, it does support the high resolution screens and you can have actually two displays also, so yes. And I have a question. Okay, yeah, so sure. um, I love the way that you can bring together and integrate different types of data, so you can bring them together in a single map. What mm -hmm. do you, what is, do you think is the most popular of all of the products that people use? That you are um, it depends on the software so so far i think the most popularity we see in a tnap so that's used for simulation it's a very popular product so we have a tnap users quite a bit we also have a power law quite a bit of users occasionally we have users for seismic so we do have those so yeah this are probably the most popular kind of packages and there is a kind of common goal usually but we also keep bringing more vendors. So soon we will have, I hope, some announcement about other vendors. So we also keep bringing more vendors and some of them are actually quite large. So just keep also kind of maybe, if you're interested in some products which are not listed, you can send us email, contact us also on the website and we'll let you know if it's coming or not. Uh, you can also go and maybe subscribe to our LinkedIn page. So every new partnerships, we make announcements there. So you'll also learn there. So, and we, we keep growing it. It's still new. So we keep kind of bringing new vendors. Oh, that's great. Well, so let's say that I have um, a lot of well logs that I've gotten that I've downloaded from free sources. Uh -huh. And, Oh, okay. Oh, well, anyway, just I was wondering how easily you can you can bring in well logs and correlate well logs. Yeah, yeah. So in terms of well logs, it's a several options. So one way actually how to bring data, it's a training, so I don't have it here. But if it's a commercial option, you see this data, so there will be a link here to data. So you can click it. And it will be like your Dropbox. So if you ever use a Google Drive or Dropbox or something like this, so you open it and it will be like a web interface and you can upload this data. You can even share the link so somebody else can upload this data. And then when you go to your workstation, it will be available right here. So you'll have this drive and all the data will just pop up here. And then you can use it as a normal way like on your local workstation. Recently, we did this for one client just like this. So they had another vendor who was providing them a big seismic project. So they just created a link for this seismic project, right? And this uh, seismic vendor, they uploaded this data for our client directly to the kind of workstations and machines. And then we just did a migration of this project. So yeah, it's a variety of ways how to do it. Oh, that's great. So we're getting some questions. Joshua yeah, sure. Turner says, this is a brilliant service. What else do you have in the pipeline, if you can say? Any structural restoration software, maybe Petrel? Uh, I can tell you about Petrel. That's very unlikely because it's a Schlumberger. And actually, they are our competitor because they have the product which called Delphi. And Delphi is pretty much the same concept as our concept. The only difference, they don't provide hourly rates. They also do kind of subscriptions. They're probably moving to this space, but when they started, it still was like a monthly subscription. So, but in terms of technology and cloud access, that's our competitor. In terms of other vendors, unfortunately, I cannot disclose it. We have a NDA signed with the vendors when we get in discussion with them. So I cannot just disclose it. Oh, okay. But you do have, so the Petrel equivalent that you have works pretty well. 
Yeah, we have RFD and their competitor to pitch shell. So T Navigator, it's a direct competitor to pitch shell. And if you think about the geological modeling packages, there are only four main, right? It's a pitch shell, it's a Roxar, right? The Roxar RMS. Then there is a Tina and uh, maybe decision workspace, maybe also a little bit. But other than this, that's kind of main four. I would call them big four. Oh, that's cool. Okay, so um, we have a, a chat question. How and where is the data stored? Okay, the data is stored in this uh, cloud. So all the data is stored in the cloud. Technically, you can try to pipe your data from your local, but performance will be too poor. So all the data is security stored in the cloud. So for each cloud, for each client, sorry, we provide like a cloud storage, a dedicated separate cloud storage, which only you have data to. So that's where the data. So it's, it will be in the cloud, but dedicated to you. And we use Amazon. So Amazon Web Services, that's our hardware and cloud provider. So we built all our services on top of it. So I okay. would say it's a, it's a very secure and we don't have any kind of issues with this. And we have some large companies using these services, even multinationals. So they check the security and they kind of agreed that it's good. Well, we have a data-related question. Are there size limitations? And how do you move the interpretation of files back to your drives? Uh, moving back is the same as you upload it. So it's the same way. You go to this web interface, and then you can download your data. So it's also easy, kind of the same way. I see also the question about the interface between software, import, export data. Blah, blah, blah. That's actually depending on the software itself, right? So some software, for instance, uh, Petrasys, I know, they have a lot of what they call connectors, right? So some of these packages, they have these connectors. And if they have this connector, you can bring data directly from other software, right? And you can have multiple software installed on your machine, right? There could be several. And that's how you migrate data. But it needs to be supported by software itself. There are some jobs right now, like uh, open subsurface uh, OSDU, for instance. So there is a consortium which is kind of thinking how we can normalize and standardize this data. But I would say it's still in the early phase. So hopefully it will come and then we'll have every software will be able to export and import to any software, but we're not there yet. So, so far it's really these connectors, like Pichel connectors and other connectors. And um, do you um, have access to IHS or drilling info well data? Um, in terms of, uh, so right now what I described is primarily the software, like applications, but there is also a big room for the, these data services, right? And we actually right now started some of this discussion about connection to data and provide also the data on our platform, but we're not there yet. So we're still trying to kind of figure out the best way to work with these data providers because it's a little bit different than the software. So we're not there yet, but we're actually thinking also about the data. Oh, that's good. Yes. I would suggest that I would imagine that a person who has a, a has already a subscription can utilize the data that they get through IHS or Enverisa. Yes, if you have already subscription, you can yeah connect to this data via browser or directly from software and pull this data directly. Yes, then will it will be no different than using your local laptop or workstation. So if you already have a subscription, then it will be no different absolutely. But I, I was talking about without getting subscription, how people can get data also kind of using our platform without subscription. So that's something we're kind of working with vendors and trying to figure out the best way to do this. So it's a little bit different. So I see another question. Is there any way to collaborate with other users on this platform? Yes, and there are several ways to do this. So one way, actually, you can have a one workstation shared between several users. So you can connect to the same workstation 
some kind of by different users. You cannot connect the same time, but you can connect at different time at the same workstation. So that's a one way to do this. And that's a good way if you have, let's say, one primary user and one secondary user, or maybe a client who wants to occasionally connect and see your work on something. So that's how it works for this kind of environment. But if you have a two users who do a lot of work, then the best way is just to have a two workstation and then you have a shared drive. And you have your you can have your project on a shared drive, then each of you have access to the same data. And we actually also set up some projects even between different countries. So you can have people in Brazil, for instance, or in Europe, people in the US, and they can still work with the same data. So we actually also doing this. Yes. Oh, that's wonderful. Wow. I mean, this is so exciting. And I just just to recap what you said at the beginning. This is a wonderful way to actually learn how to do the, the software as well. And so if someone wants to increase their marketability, they can go in and just basically learn the software and they can expand their, their potential. Yeah. Okay, so one last question and then we'll go over to John. Can you mm -hmm. expand on the capabilities of the software that handles GIS workflows for example, geographic coordinate, coordinate conversions, um, nice map for output. The best uh, maps and games, uh, a lot of seismic packages, they do support it partially, right? Not fully, but partially this GIS. But from what we have right now, I would say PetraSys. So PetraSys is really good. It has a GIS capabilities. It has a very nice maps output and everything. So this is, I think, the stellar tool for mapping a GIS from what we have. And uh, the next... Uh, the next conversation will be exactly about GIS. So John will actually cover a really good uh, open source and free tool to do some of this specifically GIS. So from us, it would be PetraSys, and John will actually cover another tool you can use for this. And you can always try, right? Even any of our tool, you can try as a learning and see if it will fulfill kind of your objectives. And that's great. And that's a wonderful segue. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, so thank you. That was wonderful. It's so informative and, and inspiring. And I'd like to, um, to introduce now uh, John McLeod, who will share his screen and will go to QGIS. And I was just commenting earlier, I really like John's sweatshirt <laughs> or t-shirt. I'm a walking billboard. <laughs> So uh, this may be a first. Um, I'm going to do a PowerPoint presentation as a prelude to some demos, and I'm going to do it entirely within QGIS. So what is QGIS? QGIS stands for Quantum Geographic Information System. If you've used ArcMap, you're familiar with this. In fact, if you've used oil and gas mapping, like Geographics and the Trail 2D, you're used to some of this uh, kind of um, uh, the structure of the GIS program. It's software used to make maps and analyze map data. So my employer already furnishes expensive mapping software. Why should I care about QGIS? Well, the reason that you should care is QGIS is free. Uh, it's versatile. Uh, it, it comes in PC, Mac, uh, Linux, and Android's, Android versions. Uh, you can set it up as a web map server. Uh, just like uh, just like the Esri product, it's open source. So if you know Python, uh, which they teach Python in elementary school, I've heard these days, uh, you can write your own plug-in programs. It's powerful. It's fast. Uh, maps can look as good or better than what you're getting with your expensive uh, employer furnished software. And finally, something I can relate to is QGIS is unemployment insurance. It allows professional development of your mapping and geoscience skills independent of an employer. So you may think that you're gold and your employment and your employer is gold. But I can tell you if you're in the commodities business, oil and gas, mining, um, you might reconsider that. So because I don't sell software, and when people ask me, is QGIS easy to learn? I tell them no. 
but then again, sophisticated mapping software is never easy. Um, it's like learning to play a musical instrument and practice will help you improve and will make it easier to use over time. And you get frustrated because the program doesn't behave the way you think or because it, 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 you think it should or because it's not like brand X mapping software. So the general workflow with learning QGIS or really any complicated program is confusion, frustration, comfort, and enjoyment. You have to tough out confusion, frustration to get to the enjoyment part. And you can get kicked back to the confusion and frustration part, especially if, uh, let's say, you jump a generation in software and all of a sudden your defaults are not the same. And, and so you can get kicked back here. But once you get a program that you like and you're using and all your projects are in it, you're there. So uh, the kinds of data types that QGIS handles, cloud data, which is um, data that's served uh, from a remote source, uh, and uh, these are often designated as, as WMS, WMTS, the W stands for web, and uh, these, this is remotely served data. User-loaded data comes from your hard drive, and it's things like tables and databases, images and raster grids, data files, point clouds, which are used for, um, uh, for 3D rendering uh, using a vector format mesh. You've seen these in computer-aided drafting. And then GIS files, like shape files. So uh, operations that you can do in QGIS, you can load and format numeric and text tables and graphic, uh, graphic files. You can georeference images, and then you can digitize off of those and, and make a vector file off of something mathematical. Uh, for instance, you can take a top, uh, a top surface and a bottom surface, subtract one, one from another, and, and make a, an isopack thickness out of it. You can query, filter, and merge um, to, uh, data. Uh, you grid and contour. I mentioned mathematical analysis using the um, uh, using the calculator program. You can uh, program in Python if you can, and you can create your own plugins. And then a really powerful tool is is linking map elements to trigger external programs into URLs. So there are two kinds of links: one to uh, the internet and one to your hard drive. Uh, about me, uh, I'm a seasoned Tulsa-based geoscientist. I work for Mobile, Oryx, EOG, Chesapeake, and SM Energy. Uh, my primary interests are in petroleum systems, uh, source rock geochemistry, field geology, paleontology. I love fossils and open source software, especially QGIS. And uh, my role is adapting this to the needs of geoscientists. It is a generic program. And uh, if you can get it to work for the kinds of stuff that you do, uh, then, you, then, then you're successful. And I also teach a, a class called QGIS for Geoscience Professionals. It's a non-drinking from a fire hose class, uh, relaxed pace, two hours a week for four weeks. And I teach it online through the Tulsa Geological Society. And there's my contact information. So uh, let's go to, um, uh, originally this was going to be about cloud layers. So let me show you, for example, what cloud layers look like. And in order to do that, I have to highlight that and click that. And I used to be gun shy about, uh, let's say, working in Oklahoma, but yet having a project that spanned the entire globe. I don't have that fear anymore. And the reason is, is because modern mapping programs and QGS as an example of a modern mapping program is fearless. You can work in Oklahoma and you can work in Russia or India or Africa if you want and have simultaneous projects going on all over the world if that's the geology you're studying. Uh, you might recognize uh, some of these other uh, um, layers in here and cloud layers tend to be global in nature although they don't, by necess they don't necessarily have to be. And so Bing imagery, you've seen this before, it's remote sensing, open street map is, uh, is streets and towns. And we can kind of go up the list. This is, this is kind of a favorite one here, uh, isostatic gravity uh, by USGS. And it is available as, as files yeah. that you can download. Yeah, those are free for universities for educational purposes, but like a, a but you have to like sign a contract saying, uh, we acknowledge Slimbrache donation of one point some million dollars of 11 licenses for us to use as educational purposes. We're not, we're not going to use it for commercial use or whatever. So you have to sign some kind of agreement. That's why we get this price estimation. So yep. okay, that's how much we get. Yeah. And this is, you know, this they're, is they're saying, okay, your students using this. So when you graduate, your students look better because the oh, yeah. company can hire you directly. You can already, you know, that kind of thing, you know. 
That's and that's true. about I don't know for like national lab, you know, they're, they're like, oh, maybe we already have this kind of license. But yeah, that's like, true. You know, they're really specific because they sell different packages. So if you're using only use it for like geologists, they get you a package only for geology, so you don't have to pay everything, you know. So I don't know. That's good. Well, thank you, Ross. Let's let's um, save our comments till the end so we don't interrupt John's flow. But that was really good information. <laughs> Where was I? Uh, anyway. Um, uh, the, the, uh, and I could spend the rest of the presentation talking about one of these layers, but the point that I want to make is that these layers tend to be global in nature and, and many of them, you can't really do anything with them. They're just static pictures. Now, this is an exception. Uh, this, this isostatic gravity is an exception because you can actually go in and you can export this thing as a georeferenced image. Uh, but they're not all like that. And because they're served from a cloud server, uh, they can put controls on. You can look at it, but you can't query it. You can't filter it. You can't do anything to that other than look at it. So uh, USGS is pretty good uh, in the stuff that they allow you to not only look at, but sometimes manipulate. So let me uh, let me go back here. I'm going to turn on. This is one of my one of my favorites here. It's called Maps for Free Ruler Leaf. And it's a color uh, elevation. It's a color elevation uh, model. And um, I'm going to turn on Oklahoma here, for example, and show you a project. So let me uh, let me go in, and I'm going to zoom to uh, Oklahoma counties, which will take me right there. And I, I have several different kinds of capabilities that I wanted to show you. This one I think is so important. Uh, because georeferencing a raster image, and this is out of an old publication. Uh, it's a structure map of the, Chess uh, of the uh, checkerboard limestone. And you can take this within this program and, uh, and georeference it and then digitize over it so that you have a shapefile that you can then compare to other shapefiles. For instance, if you want to make an isopac map, uh, you might digitize this, the, the checkerboard limestone, and then digitize a map for uh, a layer that underlies it and subtract one another to get an isopac map. You're actually making original maps off of copies. Uh, uh, you're making an original map off of, off of old scanned copies of the original. So that's a, that's a huge, um, uh, that's, a, that's actually a huge um, uh, feature that I didn't find in commercial software, for example. I didn't find if you wanted to do this kind of work, you had to go to a third party outside of the program and then and then import it. It's all done. It's all done inside of here. Um, I also mentioned linking, and I'm going to show you one example of linking here, uh, where if I can see past the uh, the menu here uh, how this works. These are URLs, and I'll show you. I'll show you two things. This one, if I can hit it is um, actually linked to YouTube. And you can see this guy has done this, uh, who runs a website called Geoscience for Professionals. That's, well, that's me. Well, I've only gotten 90 views so far. So I'm hoping that my, by, maybe by showing you this, I'll get, I'll get two or three more. Uh, let me show you another link on here that was a little more popular. And I, I'm on LinkedIn, as some of you probably know and causing lots of problems there. But sometimes I post things that are really popular. And this, this was one of them. And uh, so this is a, uh, a, 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 a picture of some Pennsylvanian pyrotized brachypods that got, well, it was on the exploration group, and it also got over 30,000 hits. So the point with linking is that you can link to anything. For instance, if you're working in an area and you have uh, literature that's in the form of a Word document or a PDF, you can put a dot on a map and link off to that, click on it, and then pop it up. Uh, this, is, this is fantastic. Uh, it's for, uh, fantastic for building a project anywhere in the world that allows you to pull all of your data together in one place and then have a map, a map interface to it. So let me shut down checkerboard here, and I'll show you a couple of other things that I've done. Uh, this one is about geothermal gradient. And this data comes from, this is a good example of a table that was loaded. And the, the data from the table shows geothermal gradient in metric units. And I gridded it, I contoured it, I smoothed the contours. And lo and behold, uh, I actually found that uh, there was an anomaly here. 
And uh, just to make sure it was an anomaly, I kind of expanded the study a little bit up in the Kansas. And sure enough, there's a, there's a couple of blobs in here that, that are highlighted. Well, I wanted to see what is the, um, what's the extent of, um, of these geothermal anomalies in the United States. So I filtered all of my data uh, that was greater than 55. All of these points are greater than 55. And sure enough, I came up with this. There's more anomalies that are over 55, but there's not very many of them. And they're in weird places. They're, they're around the Ring of Fire. They're in central Alaska. They're in the Snake River Plain, which you would expect. It's Yellowstone. It's really hot. It's in the Foreland Laramide basins of the Rocky Mountains. It's along the Gulf Coast and it's in the Illinois Basin and Finley Arch of the Midwest. So the question is, I, I've discovered something here, but I don't, I don't know what I've discovered. And I'm not gonna give you the answer to this because I'm not 100% certain, but I would say the geology is different in all of these places. And the fact that you're seeing a geothermal anomaly, yes, it is getting hotter at a higher rate the deeper that you get in these areas. But what's causing it is not the same thing in, in every area. So that's a, that's a, and I'll show you one more example in here. And this is something that I did. This is something I do in class. It's, um, uh, it's the um, uh, thermal maturity vitronite reflectance of the Woodford Formation in Oklahoma. And again, I've taken the data points, I've gridded them, I've contoured, I've smoothed the contours. I've also clipped, this, clipped it to something using a little tool so that it doesn't slop off into, into areas that don't have, uh, don't, don't have much well control. So uh, those, are, those are kind of three examples. And as a geologist, this was the most basic thing I needed to do. This is what I spent in you know, 20 or more years in companies just using software. 90% of what I did was just doing this. It was just taking data and gritting and contouring it to make an interpretation off of it. So, so this is wonderful. And, and I didn't know when I started QGIS whether or not it would work for this. So I wanna show you one other thing that I'm working on, not to be a provocateur or anything, but uh, I am doing a project right now, which is the, um, the project is entitled The Geologic Resources of Ukraine. And of course, Ukraine has been in the news a, a lot lately um, for reasons that don't have anything to do with this presentation immediately. But um, I, I wanted to see the beautiful thing about being a geologist is that you didn't know anything about the basin that you worked uh, two months ago, but now after having pulled together data and read some papers and so forth, yeah, you kind of know what's going on in it. And so I took on Ukraine as because I was curious. Well, what are the what are the geologic resources of Ukraine that that make it make it an interesting place? And here I've taken the, this is from the USGS's geology, but I've taken it, I've clipped it down to the outline of Ukraine. And I've also done something here, uh, if, I can, uh, if I can find the right control for it, where I do this, and I've got a different, different control here for it. If I can find it, I'm gonna have to, uh, I can't reach it. Sorry, it's, uh, it's under the, my, my control here. Anyway, I can click on this line and I can, I can pop up um, a cross section in here that I got from the Ukrainian Geological Survey. So uh, that's another example of linking, but that, that, that cross-section is on my hard drive. And I wish I could do this, and I don't know why I can't. Uh, there's probably a good reason. Anyway, we'll, get, we'll come back to it. Um, other things here that I wanted to show you. Uh, Oblast, let me turn this one off, turn off the geology. Uh, this, was a, this was a project that I did. I pulled this out of the literature. And this is, um, this is vitronite reflectance data. And in the Dnieper Donuts Basin, which is where all of the oil and gas and coal, not all of it, but the majority of the oil and gas and coal, and where a, a lot of the warfare is going on right now, that's the center of the oil, gas, and coal um, petroleum system uh, in, in Ukraine, the big one. Now, the, now there are others. And I'll show you, in fact, I'll, I can show you some of the others here. Let me turn on just for... Uh, just for effect here, I'm going to turn this on because it's easier to see these oblast boundaries. Now, in some parts of the world, so, uh, and oblasts are, I guess I would, I, I don't know, it's kind of like a, it's a Soviet thing. And I, I don't know whether I would, 
liken it to a county or a state exactly. I don't know how much autonomy these places have, but you can see the boundaries are really irregular. And in the United States, for example, uh, states are often surveyed. They're north-south boundaries or their east-west boundaries or a river. And you can see the rivers on here and you can see the topography but the oblast boundaries don't conform to this. And because I'm not Ukrainian or Russian or from this part of the world, I don't know why these, why the, how these oblasts were surveyed. And I haven't been successful so far in finding out. So if somebody knows, <laughs> shoot me a note. So, I, so, I, so I'll know what I'm talking about next time. Um, other things I wanted to show you on here, I have a layer that um, this is sedimentary thickness. And let me shoot back here just to show you the big picture on this. Sedimentary thickness is a file that I got from the Texas Bureau and it was done in the 90s. Uh, some of this data is 10 or 20 or 30 years old, but it shows sedimentary thickness all over the world. And part of the world that I was interested in was here. So it does give me an idea where are the basins and the two basins that you see on here, Dnieper Donats, and you see the uh, see the Black Sea down here, uh, and there is there is oil and gas here, by the way. So let me turn on, uh, for example, if I can find it really quickly, uh, World Petroleum Fields, and and I'll turn off the cloud layers so you can see a little better, and I'll turn off Ukraine stuff. Uh, let's find it here. Anyway, the, um, and I'll turn on pipelines as well. Let me turn this back on. <clears throat> so you can kind of get an idea, well, what's driving this? Well, you have these gigantic oil and gas fields in Russia, and these are the Ural Mountains here, either side of the Urals. And then you have this massive pipeline network that mostly feeds into customers, either for export out, uh, out through the Baltic Sea or on land, certainly the natural gas goes in to feed most of the countries, most of the countries of Europe, and and including Turkey down here. So um, that's uh, that's certainly that's not geological, but that is well, it is geological because it's sourced up here. And uh, I hope in the uh, coming weeks to learn more about the geology. Uh, and east of the Urals would be considered Siberia, I think, and and west would be considered European. So uh, I hope in the uh, coming. Uh, days and weeks when I get this prepared. I'm, I'm going to do a presentation on this through Tulsa Geological Society of the uh, Geological Sources of Ukraine, but uh, I wanted to show you some of the capabilities in here and I've gridded and contoured, I've brought in data, uh, and uh, I've, I've scrounged a lot of this stuff too. I mean, it's amazing that I could find pipelines and that I could find oil and that I could find field outlines and so forth to put on this. So, um, with that, I'm going to, uh, we have about a few minutes for questions, and, uh, and I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to take some questions now. Well, it looks like we have one. It says, um, John, can um, you use, can you modify contours with manual editing? Absolutely. Uh, it's got an editing mode, and you take the contour file, you put it in editing mode and it's just about like every other software where you grab the nodes and scoot them over. And that's assuming that your, uh, your contours don't have, well, I, I shouldn't say that they don't have too many nodes. Um, a contour has a few nodes when you digitize it and a lot of nodes after you smooth it. And so if you want to do that kind of work, I would suggest, suggest doing it on the raw digitized contour if that's what you're talking about. If it's something with a, with a Bezier curve in it uh, that has a zillion nodes in it, um, yeah, there's probably, probably a way to uh, group select those and move them in bulk, but it's gonna be, it's gonna be more difficult. Excellent. Okay, so <clears throat> David Bird asks, can you mention image processing? Um, could you be a little more specific about image processing? Well, 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 we're getting that together. Oh, okay. Well, I could, I, I could rattle something off. Yeah, just Dave. I was thinking like, um, you know, aerial photographs, um, modifying color, editing color, um, things like that. 
Oh yeah, that's that's all real basic. Um, okay. There's a, there's there's an overabundance of controls on color, uh, colors and grids, colors in in imported images, uh, color depth. Uh, I mean, it's um, uh, you have you have lots of control over that. The only thing that I found that's a little different between this and um, commercial software is, for example, if you create a contour map and you have attributed the contours, you put numbers on the contours. If you want to, um, let's say, uh, let's say your, your contours were every 10 feet, but you wanted to make them every 20 feet, so you wanted to get rid of half of them. Well, that's actually pretty easy in commercial software. In this, you have to either run it again and specify a different contour interval, or you you make a filter for it and you filter out every other contour. Uh, so that's that's a little more geeky and clunky than uh, just specifying it and rerunning it like like in some programs. But yes, all, all of that. Uh, I, I don't, honestly, I don't, I, I haven't found anything as far as basic mapping capabilities that I'm missing from, from any of that other software. And the product that you get out of this graphically, aesthetically is just as good. It's got, in terms of gridding algorithms, it's got uh, over a dozen, uh, my go-to, and, and they don't all work on every data set you have. In fact, gridding is kind of a trial and error thing. You find one that works on a data set, every data set is, is, is unique and the, the points are clustered differently. There's different numbers of points and so forth. And, uh, and then, so sometimes you're poking around, well, do I use inverse distance weighting? Do I use triangulation? Do I use cubic spline? And those are your go Krieging, those are kind of your go-to ones. And then, you know, and you can digitize using TIN, for example, you can digitize off the contours uh, because the contours actually have embedded in them uh, vertices and it's seeing the vertex vertices. You don't see them, but it sees them. Uh, and then, but if you have points like vitronite reflectance points, Cardot's uh, map, for example, um, that you would use something like, you know, some of them are designed just to use points. And most of them are designed just to use point data. So um, I got, I got off on gridding, but I didn't, I didn't mean to, but well, that, that's okay because that, that's a good segue to a, a grid related question. Do you grid and contour within QGIS, or is that done with another program like Surfer? Huh. No, it's uh, all these uh, all these algorithms for gridding. Let me show you where you get to them. Uh, this searches if I type in grid here, for example. Now, not all gridding is called gridding, and so here's. Uh, grid, inverse distance weighting, inverse distance weighting of power, et cetera. That's one set of them. But they're also, uh, there's also Krieg, which is a thing in itself. And then uh, if you search raster, for some reason, some people don't distinguish between grids and rasters, but you can make attributed rasters uh, that, um, if I can find it here, it's called uh, somewhere down at the bottom here raster analysis, and that's where uh, one vendor here has uh, cubic spline and a bunch of other things. Yeah, it's it's the Gidal ones. Anyway, I'm going to spend all day looking for it, but trust me on this, you will be happy. There will be so many different gridding algorithms in here, and if the first one doesn't work, try the next one. And, and that's, uh, there, there is that trial and error aspect to it. Oh yeah, one other thing I forgot to, I forgot to put in here, um, uh, plate boundaries, uh, that's very helpful. Uh, also, uh, it's got earthquakes, uh, you can add, uh, you can add earthquakes and that's a, that, that's a plug-in. Let me, let me go here so you can see this a little better. And it doesn't, there's no real time. It's not like a web page that has real time refreshing. And so if, if you did this yesterday, for a week's worth of earthquakes, but you want to update to tomorrow, you have to download an, a, a new set, or you have to download an updated set. But um, but that is that is out there, and that's helpful as well. Um, I've done some uh, I've done some other things here. Let me see if I've got any got any examples of this. Um, I'm going to show you this just to peek at it. Uh, I like I like Ron Blakey's stuff a lot, and if I'm working a new area, for example. 
uh, I kind of want to know what his opinion about what, let's say, uh, this area was like uh, in the Ornavision, for example. And so fortunately, this series of Ron Blakey maps, and I've, I've, I, I have georeferenced these, and I, actually these aren't georeferences, these are, these are, are ungeoreferenced images, but I, but I have added the Ukraine outline. And fortunately, this series of maps <laughs> was almost centered on Ukraine. So I've got, I've got the whole geologic series uh, for, as can be part of this presentation, at least for, for reference purposes. So yeah, being, being, able to bring, being, being able to bring in pictures and then georeference them and use them, georeferenced or not, is, is huge. I mean, that's, that's how you get a PowerPoint inside of QGIS. So, okay, so a lot of people are going to say, okay, well, so people are wondering about the, the pipeline data, data sets, geothermal data sets. And I think that to me, to my mind, there are two different ways to get those one is by importing the data. The second is just to use a plugin where it's already um, formatted for you. Which, where can you talk a little bit about the pipeline and geothermal and pale and, and tectonics plugins and data sets and what you do to clean them up? Yeah, um, I, I've been I, I've been in the mapping business for decades now. And I call this, I call the modern mapping programs magic because they're so forgiving. Uh, you can have 10 different project, you can have files that are, that are hard coded in 10 different projections. And if you're working in this, which is a global projection, it's pseudo Mercator 38, 3857, you can bring in all, and they can be raster, they can be vector, and you can bring them in and what you see on your screen will be warped and adjusted to the um, coordinate reference system, the projection that, you, that you're in. And, and that doesn't require any, any effort on your part. Um, files that are georeferenced, if they're raster, um, they have, there are special re uh, georeferenced raster files, or you can make your own. You can bring in uh, inert files and make them georeferenced inside of here. Uh, if you bring in a shape file, it is by, def by definition georeferenced. Uh, if you want to take really any other kind of data and you can bring it in as a picture of some sort, you can make it georeferenced with, within here. But no, it doesn't care. It's a mix and match world. It doesn't care what the projection is of the file you're bring is bringing in as long as it has been correctly identified as to what, and I call it CRS, the the coordinate reference system, as long as it's been correctly identified. If it hasn't been correctly identified, it's going to put it in the wrong place on the map. Yeah, that makes sense. So um, I'm just jumping around to different questions, but there was one. Um, is there a good web publishing plugin? Um, I, I, I'm going to take a stab at what I think you mean here. Uh, there is a way to take uh, your project or parts of your project and put it online. And it's a plugin uh, like, like a WMS, a web map service. And uh, it's not something that is native to QGIS, but there is a company that has developed a plugin, both a free version and a pay version where you can kind of set up your own web map service of your project. So I could take this project. Now you, you'd, I'd have to pay them to put this in, in their web map service. If I wanted to put a single picture out there and make it available to everybody in the world through a URL, yeah, I, I can do that for free. If it's something more, more aggressive than that, um, then, then you have to pay to use their service. And I, yeah, I was curious about that too, because yeah, I'm pulling these things off the USGS Atlas, and it's a web map service. And I don't think it allows, and I'd say that, I don't think it actually allows you to pull data off of there. You have to download files elsewhere. But uh, some, some services do operate web map services where they'll, they'll allow you to download off of there. Gen generally not, though. Usually the files are located on a page that require you to download not off their, not off their web map. So, so yeah, in terms of web maps, yes, you can make one and you can put it online. And you can have everybody in the world look at it if, if, you, if you so choose. 
Um, so one thing we can do, uh, <clears throat> we have a lot more questions, but what we'll do is we have time for one more and then we'll have um, Vitali talk a little bit about things as a kind of wrap up and then we can stay a little bit later and, and entertain some of the other questions that people want to. But the big question is, is there a repository of links to map elements that are freely available from various resources so someone can tap into one place for access to free layers? If someone compiled links to such layers, like in GitHub or something? Um, <laughs> the short answer is no. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, And the reason for that is there are so many sources of data and uh, finding data is, uh, if, you, if you're an exploration geologist, you understand what it's like to find data in an area and you find it where you find it. And it may be in some obscure place. Uh, I was shocked that I could find pipelines. I was shocked that I could find oil and gas fields of the world. And oftentimes it's just using the right search engine and being able to phrase a query in the right way that uh, that you're successful in, in finding something. Now, um, I, I probably shouldn't even bring this up. Some of these sources that you find, well, here's pipelines of the world. Is that a legal source? I don't know. You know, I'm downloading something, and um, I, I don't know that it was obtained legally. So that is that is something that um, I, I think if you go through a commercial vendor, well, who knows where they get their stuff? But they but they do make some effort to. Uh, uh, you know, make sure that whatever they're selling has been legal, legally obtained. So, well, yeah, and then that just reminds me of all the shenanigans in, in data in general in the oil industry. So, um, <laughs> in other industries. So, you know, one of the key things I think in anything is being having being comfortable and knowing your sources and the data integrity issue. Yeah, and I, I and I admit, I mean, some of this stuff I know. Uh, is is out of date um, and and but even out of date I, I mean the fact that you're looking at and a lot of the stuff we are using is out of date i mean i'm pulling things i'm pulling images out of a 1920s publication a, a structure map of a field in oklahoma but i'm digitizing it and i'm using it and it's it was correct i think at the time that it was made um, did later data invalidate the interpretation, well, well, maybe, but that's due diligence. That's what I have to do to figure that out. But it's a starting point. I, I don't, I, you know, you're using other people's stuff. You're always using other people's stuff, and uh, you can't necessarily take it, take it to the bank. On the other hand, if you have, you know, reputable sources and more than one source, then, you know, it's like, like legal proof. Then it's probably okay. Um, I, I haven't. Um, I haven't personally encountered any problems, but it's maybe because my standards are so low uh, that I'm willing to accept even old data for what it is. Uh, just because it's old doesn't mean it's not valid. It just means that it was probably valid for the time in which it was made. And if you go in with that understanding, then you don't have unrealistic expectations about it. Great. Well, I know we haven't gone Got, been able to get to all the questions, but I wanted to let Vitali say a few final words and then John, and then, and then we can stay on for a few more minutes to uh, follow up with questions. Okay. So Vitali? Um, uh, I didn't put them um, our emails, but if you want to learn any more details and have any questions, you can go to our website, petrocubic.com. We have a contact form. We also have actually a live chat. You can also actually chat with us if you have any questions. So yeah, just uh, we are reachable and I hope yeah, we can help you with uh, training and software and everything. And actually, just I was thinking about this, so maybe there is also a way. We also have a forum, so maybe we can post some of these links and helpful resources to a forum, so it's a publicly available and people can read it and add their own links and resources. So maybe it's something we can talk about a little bit later between three of us. But it just jumped on my mind when people started to ask about all these links and resources. Right, that's a really good idea. Let's let's try to do that. And in addition, um, 
I think that any kind of training, like in, in Vitaly, in your, your case, it's kind of self-starting, self-directed training that people learn how to do the software. John has a more formal course, and that's at, in Tol through Tulsa Geological Society. Um, I'm involved in that, so that society, so I'm proud of that. <laughs> anyway, um, John, can you tell us a little bit about when your course will start? Um. Well, I, I don't know if it's I don't know if it's because I'm lazy, but I I'm only teaching it once a year, and um, it'll be taught again in January of next year. Um, we had a limit of thirty uh, on the last one that we did, and we sold we sold out on it. Um, and if there's more demand, there's no reason that we can't increase it. Um, the format of the course, like I say, I I've been to courses where I call it drinking from a fire hose. And it's so much information in such a short period of time that you feel like you've been put through a ringer when you come out of it. And so my course is the opposite of that. It's two hours over four weeks. And I have little homework assignments and people work on it. And then they have a week to think about it, to learn it. And like I say, it is a musical instrument. You have to practice. And so you're, you're, if, if I taught it all, all eight hours in one day, you probably wouldn't learn as much as if you take it over a period of time and have time to practice it. So, um, so, and now, now I have said that, and I've I've had an inquiry about, um, well, actually more than one about teaching it elsewhere. And um, the thing that I would say is that I'm I'm loyal to TGS as far as globally um, because they sort of launched me into this. But um, if it's for an organization and the members of an organization only, that I'm also that I'm, I'm, I'm also open to it. The flip side of it is that part of the reason that it can be as interesting as it is, and I think it's interesting, is because I have good examples because I'm a working geologist. I'm actually working on stuff and bringing it in as examples of how to use mapping, this mapping software to solve geologic problems. And if I was just teaching how, how to hit buttons and how to do generic stuff, it wouldn't be nearly as much fun and for anybody. So I do need that time in there to go do geology so I can bring some new examples and not have it get stale. So I, maybe I'm justifying my laziness again, but um, that, that's, why I don't, that's why I don't like, I, I, I wouldn't do this full time, but I will, I will entertain, um, you know, request to teach to or specifically to organizations and their members. And, and I loved what you were saying about software and, and being frustrated. I mean, like, I just finished a, a, a book, um, just came out a few weeks ago on Moodle 4.0. And I've, I've been doing these like training manuals for this. Um, it's a kind of learning experience, learning management system for years. And what's interesting about it is that any, like any kind of open source, when it, when it, even if there's a lot of, of support for it, you have to be patient because the, the updates can be completely different. And, and so, and you have to just like be, but like once you get into it, it's really intriguing when they do have updates. So I just really appreciate your approach to that. And I think that uh, Vitali, um, this is an opportunity also if somebody wanted to like partner, they can just say guide a person through it, some of this stuff. Yeah, I like what Ross was saying earlier about when he uh, mentioned the fact that a lot of companies will license their software while you're a student, for example, Schlumberger or within like Hampson Russell used to. Um, and I, I noticed that you have that through PetroCubic, which is cool. And what that does is it gives the student um, capabilities to go, go right, you know, it's like onboarding. And then from their perspective, it gives them the ability, from the vendor's perspective, <laughs> people will stick with their software because they know it. Yeah, well, that's, that's correct. And we kind of made this agreement with the vendors to let it do since it is kind of initially was a little bit concerned, but then we kind of convinced them that it's a good way to do this and we protect also the data. So, and they don't have any hassle with this, right? If you try to do something like this on your own, yeah, you might, but uh, they don't like it, right? 
and it's kind of a lot of hassle. So we kind of convince them that it's a good way for everybody, right? They don't need to pay anything. So we have automated everything. So we just pay a little bit to Amazon to host and provide all these resources and we pass this course through, so yes. That's great. And then I've also, just on another side, you know, I've found that um, actually learning theory supports this. If you have an actual project that you're working on and you can build on prior experience, it's um, much more engaging and you'll learn a lot faster than just like random <laughs> principles. Well, thank you everyone. I think um, we, we pretty much come to the end of the time. Um, we had a lot of people who signed up for who are living in Asia Pacific, Africa, Europe. So it might be a little bit late for them. So, so if, if you're viewing this as, as a recording, thank you also. And I want to thank everyone who attended live. It's been a fantastic experience. And finally, I want to just thank you, Vitali and John, for, for um, incredibly valuable information. And hopefully we'll do this again and we'll, we'll tackle maybe a, a different aspect, maybe a specific challenge or problem and kind of model it. So to give people um, an impression of what it's like to be in a project. So anyway, thank you. Uh, thanks, to, thanks to everyone for, uh, for listening. Thank you everybody for joining. You'll be getting a copy of the recording.